You're looking at a clip from She Blinded Me With Science, one of MTV's first video hits and one of his first MTV pop star, rock star hits, Thomas Dolby. I'm David Hoffman, longtime documentary filmmaker, YouTube guy right now, and I'm a good friend and a colleague of Thomas Dolby. He and I have done a lot of projects together, both musically based and also things in Silicon Valley when he started a company and I was kind of his ally and support guy. So I said to Thomas, Thomas, how did you get to make that video? Why make that video? And MTV, I mean, you're in London at the time. I didn't know the story and he decided to tell it to me. So you're about to see a Zoom call between me and Thomas where I'm asking Thomas about MTV, the early days in London, the 1970s, that underground music movement that he was a part of. In those days, England was even more different from the USA than it is today. Uh, because in those days, we had our own TV shows and movies. We had our own culture. Uh, it was a very homogenous kind of um, uh, a culture there. And um, today, you know, a lot of kids share the same shows. Uh, they watch them on the Internet. If an American kid and an English kid, you know, met on a bus, they would instantly have stuff to talk about that they had in common. In those days, we were truly two countries separated by a common language. So you wouldn't, if you went to the States with a, to the UK for the first time, then there's, there's nothing you would recognize. It was an alien culture. And our pop culture was entirely dictated by the BBC. The BBC basically ran the pop charts. And in order to get on the pop charts, you had to have two things. Number one, you had to get radio play on BBC Radio 1. They had a playlist, and if you're on the A-list, you would get played every couple of hours every day. And then number two, they had a TV show called Top of the Pops. And Top of the Pops, you may have seen it. It was shot in a studio with an audience of teenagers, a few cameras dotted around a stage, and a band on stage miming to their hit. So... Every week the chart came out on a Tuesday and if you were in, let's say, number 20 to 30 in the charts, would tell you you're going to be on Top of the Pops this week. So then you show up to the studio, you shoot Top of the Pops, you get played on the radio all week and if you don't have a top 20, top 10 hit, then something is seriously wrong. And unless you had those things, you weren't going to have a hit. And the BBC Pop was entirely run by like five or six sort of white middle-aged producers who we called the lovies and the lovies would get together in their country houses over the weekend and decide basically what was going to be in the pop charts the following week um, so that was that was the pop side of things in the streets and in the underground different story altogether so 1980 1981 we'd had punk rock you know we'd had the sex pistols and the clash rebelling against sort of the corporate commercialized nature of pop music um they were rebels they were disgusting they were outspoken they were like gutter rats you know and people of my generation absolutely loved them whether you liked their music or not it was just great that they were sticking it to the establishment you know and the establishment in those days was margaret thatcher and ronald reagan right? <laughs> and they were tight right? so the underground was this thriving uh, art environment uh, that you know was just fantastic to be a part of and if you could break into the pop commercial side of things by the BBC then you know that was great that was the only way to make any money in those days was to crack that but at the same time we were kind of snooty about it me and my friends it's like oh you're going on top of the pops you sold out <laughs> I get it was MTV a moment in time I'm just going to do it and if so how did you get to what I consider to be very high production quality on that first video? That is a really classy, professionally made, looks to be super expensive video. I was one of the lucky ones that was able to get a record deal with a major label. Now, remember that in those days, the only way the public was going to get to hear you was if you got signed up by a big record company and they would pay to put you in the studio and then go through all the marketing to get you on the radio and on top of the pops. Um, otherwise, the world would never get to hear you. I mean, if the Beatles had never got signed, we would never have heard of the Beatles. It would be like that movie yesterday. <laughs> um, so 
uh, I was one of the lucky ones that got signed up. And my record, my first album came out in England and in the rest of Europe. And it, it did, you know, commercially not great. It was critically acclaimed. People loved it, got great reviews, won some awards. I had a lot of respect, you know, I was growing a live audience when I would go on tour. Uh, but America was the big market. It was, you know, three or four times the size of the UK record industry. And to make it big, you had to crack America. So my album had come out in 1981 in the USA, and it really made almost no impact at all. And, you know, America had its own thing going on commercially. You had to get the radio networks uh, behind you. You had to get massive radio play to have a hit. And I wasn't getting radio play. You know, my stuff was too odd. It was like too, it wasn't really rock and roll. You know, I didn't have that white dancey thing. Uh, I was getting played in urban clubs, which was which was sort of amazing. Uh, but a lot of people actually assumed that I, I was actually a black guy from England, um, you know, based on the, on the grooves of, of some of my stuff. And um, so, you know, the fact that I wasn't getting played on the radio in the USA meant I had to find a different way in. And that's either by constant touring, which is not really an option because I didn't have a full time band, uh, or by this new thing called MTV. And uh, it was very hip at the time. In fact, cool people, you know, would stay in on a Saturday night to watch MTV instead of going out to a club or a concert. Um, and it was influential. If you had a hit on MTV, hit video, then the radio stations would start playing it too. So I really saw, you know, when I heard about MTV, uh, I saw it as an alternative way to crack America. Tell me how you did that, what you thought in your mind and what you did and what you thought would happen. When it became apparent to me that MTV was powerful and that having a hit video on MTV could be make or break for my pop career, I set about thinking how I could make the ultimate MTV video. Now, it's very early days and some of the videos on MTV there were few of them. There are still a lot of sort of shots of like up the lead guitarist trouser leg, you know, as he played a lead guitar solo and stuff like that. It was sort of still very 70s and sort of Soul Train, you know, American Bandstand style. But there were a few people that were getting creative with the format. You got three and a half minutes to make a little film. And to me, it was like a silent film with music. And I loved silent film, you know, I'd always been a big fan of Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, people like that. I loved the little uh, vignettes, the little stories that they would tell, you know, entirely with visuals. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do the same thing with my music video, except it's going to have a great soundtrack as well. So I set about uh, coming up with a story, a storyboard for the video. And this, I had this th phrase in my head, you know, blinded by science. She blinded me with science. I had this idea about, about it. And so I started writing a storyboard uh, for the video. And I actually sketched it out. I bought a pad that had little TV windows on it. And I did little sketches. And I took it into my record company, EMI. And I said, you know, I'd like to make this. It's unlike anything that you've probably seen before. I've got a, a vision for it and I want to do it myself. I want to I want to direct the video myself and I want you to give me the budget for it. And, uh, you know, the budget to shoot for a day in those days was like 10,000 quid. Uh, the reason for that was that everything was unionized and it was all film. She blinded me with science. Well, I've known you a long time. And I think of you as something of a scientist, and maybe even you come from scientists, it appeared to me. Was there any relationship there? Uh, I mean, the, the video to me today is really funny. I think the, uh, the young scientist image was probably my own fault. Um, so picture yourself in 1981, the pinups of the day were people like Simon Le Bon from Duran Duran, uh, Adamant, uh, Sting, these were poster kids, you know, that you would stick up on your wall and teenagers fell in love with them, male and female. And I wasn't going to compete in the handsome boy stakes. So I had this idea that, OK, I'll go in the other direction. You know, I'll be a, a, a scientist or as we, we call them in England, a boffin. And a boffin is a kind of a geek that invents things that you sort of MacGyver things together. Right. So I always had that in school. I was always a tinkerer. 
And I had the nickname Dolby. That's not my last name. My last name is Robertson. But in school, they called me Dolby because I was the first kid in class that got a cassette player with a Dolby button on it. So they called me Dolby. So I was Thomas Dolby and I was the boffin. And I decided that I would try and make something of this sort of scientific image. And uh, in, in fact, as I traveled around the world doing like promotion for my album, I went to Japan and I saw a magazine cover and I asked somebody, there was a picture of it on me in some Japanese text. I said, what does this say? And it says, Young Scientist of the Year. <laughs> this magazine had awarded me Young Scientist of the Year. So I was a little bit worried about this, you know, because it was like a bit of a sort of self caricature, you know, and it wasn't it, it, it. I was worried it'd be a dead end to go down the sort of scientific route. So when I made the video, I had this idea, OK, if I was to hire a bona fide scientist to have in the video, then it would make me look pretty cool by comparison. Right. <laughs> so there was a guy in the UK on the BBC. He was like a BBC scientist. He was sort of like the Bill Nye, the science guy, you know, of our generation. His name was Dr. Magnus Pike. And he, he was originally a scientist, but now a TV personality. And he was very quirky in English. And he would go on kids' TV shows and they'd send in questions. You know, what is a black hole? They go, well, a black hole is this thing out in space. And you, this, was, this was his whole shtick, right? So I thought, well, maybe I can hire this guy to be in my video. It'd be kind of fun to have him in the video. So. I got out a copy of um, Central Casting Catalog. <laughs> and sure enough, there he was, Dr. Magnus Pike. And you could hire him by the hour or by the day. So uh, I got in touch with him and I said I wanted him to do a, a, a pop song and a pop video. And he said, OK, OK, I'm up for that. And uh, I got him to my studio and I'd sent him his script before. He said, now, what is it you want me to say again, Dolby? And I said, OK, uh, it's there on your sheet, Dr. Pike. Dr. Pike, you're going to say, she blinded me with science. And I rolled the tape and he said, <clears throat> she blinded me with science. And I said, ah, Dr. Pike, that's that's great. Um, but it's not really a question. It's more of a statement. And he said, yes, but as a known scientist, it'd be a bit, it's a bit surprising if the girl blinded me with science. <laughs> And, and that kind of summed up his attitude. And, and um, this carried over when we got to do the video and I had him for a morning. I had him for like four hours and I'd sent him the script and I wanted him to wear a white coat, one of those little mirrored things on his head. And he refused absolutely to wear that. And I said, why? He said, I get my suits tailored at Savile Row. My public expect me to look chic. I'm not going to wear a white coat. I'm not that kind of scientist. <laughs> And I'm thinking, look at the look at the zeros on that check, Dr. Pike. You're any kind of scientist I want you to be for the next four hours. Is it like a surprise to you what occurred? I mean, I have no idea whether you said, yeah, that's what, this is going to be a big hit. Or you had no idea yourself what was going to happen. I really had no idea what was going to happen with it. But I had I, I had a sort of intuitive sense that it might take off. Um, I'd been around hit makers before. Um, a good friend of mine whose band I used to be in, this guy called Bruce Woolley, and he wrote Video Killed the Radio Star. And that was a big hit in the US, you know, a year or so before mine. And they also had a, you know, a very successful video. So I'd, I'd watched, you know, I'd, that had sort of rubbed off on me. I'd seen that from afar. I'd also, you know, I was a keyboard player, synthesizer player. I'd played as a session musician on some very successful records, including Foreigner 4. Um, had a song called Waiting for a Girl Like You. It's number one in the USA. Very prominent synthesizers on it. And people knew me for that. I'd written a hit song for a lady called Lena Lovitch, who was a sort of punk diva. And I'd written and uh, arranged a song called New Toy that had been a hit. So I'd been peripherally around people that had broken through the glass ceiling. So it wasn't it wasn't like, you know, I'd won the lottery or this was a, a pipe dream. <laughs> um, I wasn't that surprised, but I was shocked, you know, as, as a human being because people used to ignore me, you know, when I was growing up, I was a wallflower. <laughs> you know? I went straight from being a wallflower to being the center of attention. 
And it's like, why are all these people staring at me, you know? And I had the little round glasses and I was like in the fishbowl. I was like the goldfish swimming around the fishbowl with the light, the flashbulbs popping and all these socialites, you know, wanted to swan around and invite me to parties and things. So that was very weird and that, and that was a, a strange sensation. But uh, yeah, no, was it surprising? No, I, I guess there's, I have an arrogant side as well. I think you have to have this to be a performer. You know, I'm like 90% hermit weirdo and 10 percent you know exhibitionist show off um narcissist you know you have to have that i think to be a top performer and so that 10 percent of me uh thrived on this um i lapped it up and i filled those shoes very comfortably so at this time when you're making this uh, movie you're not a filmmaker but you got to do all the filmmaking stuff like editing completion post-production mix i mean What's going on at that time? I absolutely loved the film editing process. I mean, you wouldn't believe it these days. Um, you, you go into a little editing suite and there's a rack on the wall with these strips of film, you know, for each shot. And you say to the editor, I think we need to go to a close up there. And he'd say, hang on a second. And he'd go like across the room and he'd like take down a piece of film and he'd put it on this big weird Frankenstein machine and he'd, he'd look through it for a good place to cut. And he'd go, well, we can't cut there because the hand's coming into frame right here. And he put it down. He'd go, Shoom! and he'd just cut the film and glued it into a different piece of film, right? And, and if the close-up didn't work, then you're kind of screwed. You've got to put the whole thing back together and back on the rack and start again. And before you know it, it's half an hour. So the technology was just astonishing to me. And I loved editing. So I was editing She Blinded Me With Science in a little edit suite in Soho, London, which is where the film's, film business is really based or was then. And in the edit suite next door was a guy called Steve Barron editing a video for Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. Billie Jean was the first single from the album Thriller, which, as you recall, was like, a, you know, sold tens of millions of copies, absolutely established Michael as a global superstar. At the time, he was a big star, but he wasn't, you know, what he became. Uh, and I got the word one day from my friend Steve in the video next door that Michael was coming. It was very hush hush, but Michael was flying in from L.A. to be at the edit for his Billie Jean video. And I met Michael literally by the water cooler in the corridor outside the edit suite. And he didn't know anybody in London, but he'd heard my song. And he thought that I was an American dude, right? Based on the groove, they were playing my song in the clubs already. And he was astonished to find out that I was English. And he gave me his phone number. And I wrote it in my Filofax. You remember Filofaxes, like those things. So um, the song came out. It was a big hit in the USA. MTV were all over it. Thank you, MTV, by the way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I was one of the people that they made a star. Uh, if the founders are still alive, then maybe they'll, they'll watch this and, and it's my belated gratitude to them. Anyway, so I, I arrived in the States. I was a huge hit over there. I didn't know anybody in Los Angeles. I got off a plane. I was sick. I, I had mono. I, had mon I was absolutely suffering and I had to go right from the airport to do a live TV show in Burbank, right? And there was this whole entourage backstage, you know, from my record company and everything. And they wanted to take me out to Sunset Strip to, you know, Carlos and Charlie's and the Rainbow Room and all these places. And I said, actually, I'm busy this evening. I've agreed to see a friend. And they said, oh, you want to use the phone here? We'll drop you off, you know. And I opened my file of facts. And the only L.A. number I've got is Michael Jackson. <laughs> So I, I dial it thinking I'm going to have to pretend it's going to be like an answering service. I'm going to have to pretend that he's there and that, you know, I'm going out already. But to my astonishment, a little voice goes, hello. And I go, uh, Michael, it's Thomas, Thomas Dolby. We met in London. And he says, oh, Thomas, how, you know, where are you? And I said, where are we guys? And Burbank. I'm in Burbank, California. And he, and he says, well, I live in Encino. It's really close. Why don't you come over? And I said, guys, can you drop me in Encino? And uh, they say, sure. And it was pouring with rain. And this fleet of three limos drives me up like Havenhurst Avenue in Encino with like, you know, rain was just torrentially gushing down. And they dropped me. I say, you can just drop me at the gate. Little did I know it's like a quarter of a mile walk from the gatehouse, you know, up to the main house. So they dropped me off. And in the lights of their headlights, um, uh, dodging puddles i walk up this driveway towards this big palatial mansion and in the 
uh, through the front door, there's like glass sidings. I, I ring the bell and I can see these sort of twin marble staircases coming down to a big hallway. And a little figure starts stepping down from the top. And it's Michael and he's wearing pink silk pajamas. And he opens the door for me and I come in and I'm like something the cat dragged in. I'm dripping, I'm dripping water that's like pooling around my feet. And he points me to a bathroom and there's some paper towels and I'm like dabbing myself with paper towels. And I come out into the hallway and in the hallway, he's got um, art treasures. It's like a museum. He's got a solid gold Venetian clock and next to that an ivory chess set and next to that a Darth Vader helmet. And in the middle of the room, he's got this enormous throne that looks like it was made for Henry VIII. <laughs> so Michael climbs up into this throne and he looks like a little action figure. <laughs> and the only thing for me to sit on is an Ottoman. <laughs> so I'm still damp and I'm, I'm perched on this Ottoman and Michael's in this giant throne. And we start talking about music. And amazingly, you know, given the bizarre circumstances, um, we, we have a lot in common. We're talking about different mixing boards and different synthesizers that we like and, you know, working with different musicians. And we have a lot in common, you know, we're the same age, same height. Um, we both travel a lot as a kid. He traveled, he was on the road with his brothers. I, I was with my archaeology father, archaeologist father. And um, uh, we're having this very comfortable conversation. I'm just like settling in. And suddenly I hear blasting out of a up, upstairs doorway, I hear my song at like 110 decibels. And I look up and there's like little faces in the banisters and they disappear. And I'm thinking this is very strange. And I look up again and there are all these kids basically peering through the banister, maybe a dozen of them. And I go, Michael, what's, what's up with the kids? And he says, well, they're some of the kids from the neighborhood and on Thursday nights they come over to play with their radio controlled cars. And he says, come on down here, guys. And traipsing down the steps come his neighbor kids in their dressing gowns with their, you know, Tonka toys and radio controlled cars. And they, they sit down on the Persian rug playing with these toys uh, while we carry on our conversation. And every now and then Michael goes, yeah, excuse me, Billy, don't do that. Go ahead. Jimmy, no, we have to share our toys. Sorry, you were saying about the Synclavia. So we have this this conversation and, and you know, after maybe an hour, uh, I said, you know, I should really be getting back. I'm kind of jet lagged and I'm fe not feeling that great. And he says, uh, well, I'll, I'll see if my brother Randy can drive you back over to Hollywood. So he calls up his brother Randy in a different wing of the house. And, and Randy comes and drives me back over Laurel Canyon to my hotel. Um, and that was the end of the evening. It was a very, very uh, bizarre evening. Uh, but before you get any different idea, was this sinister to me? No, it was a strange, a strange recluse um, with some very eccentric ideas and too much money and success who enjoys the company of kids. Uh, there was nothing about it that I saw that was sinister and everything I heard in later years about those relationships I took with a pinch of salt because what I saw there was completely innocent and Michael he was like one of those kids you know that was just who he was. Did you go on to use MTV or for you was that like thing and then you went back to doing your thing and if so did you continue in that style that you conceived of or was that just for you a one-hit wonder? I think I'm an opportunist, really. Um, you know, I, I found myself thrust into this very privileged situation where I was suddenly the toast of the town. A lot of influential people had noticed my music and how quirky it was and how different, and they thought they'd like to meet the guy behind it. And so I found myself in <clears throat> a series of strange situations like that Michael Jackson situation. And uh, it was like a big game of Monopoly, you know, where in the early stages, you just buy into every square you land on. Um, all these opportunities came up and I thought, you know, my 15 minutes of stardom might be over in 15 minutes. So <laughs> I'd really better take advantage of these things as they come along. So I got to work with some amazing people and uh, got to meet most of my heroes. And um, I had a fabulous and, and, you know, very blessed career. 
Um, but the best thing about all of it was that I was able somehow to juggle art and commerce. I saw all of this as a springboard that enabled me to work as an artist without worrying about getting paid. Um, where if an idea was a good idea, like the Invisible Lighthouse, or like you know many of my sort of darker, more intro, introspective records, um, those were enabled by the fact that I had commercial success, which paid the rent and uh, uh, gave me that runway to make the stuff that I really loved. I want to thank you for talking with me, Thomas. It's always fun. I appreciate my relationship with you. I'm going to end here, although it's tempting to go on for an hour, because these stories, even for young people, I believe, are meaningful. They like knowing our history, your generation and my generation. But let's say bye for now, and let's see what happens with this. And I will remind people in the description that you have a book out which has a lot of the color and flavor of this time and other times in your life. So anyway, old friend, thank you. Thank you, David.